Hughes isn't famous, but he should be. He's a geologist specializing in hydrocarbons, oil, gas, coal, and for 32 years he labored for the Geological Survey of Canada. He developed Canada's national coal inventory, and he's an internationally recognized expert on energy supplies. In recent years, he's become totally preoccupied with what he calls the energy sustainability dilemma. His message, bluntly put, is that most estimates of the energy still readily available to power industrial society are wildly optimistic. Yes, there are plenty of hydrocarbon deposits left in the ground, but we've already burned most of the easily captured fuels. What's left is difficult and expensive to get at, and much of it will never be produced because the act of producing it uses more oil than it yields. To Dave Hughes, climate change is a real issue, but in the short term, will be much more dramatically affected by the fact that we can't increase hydrocarbon supplies to keep up with the increasing demand. The oil and the gas and the coal simply can't be produced. And that fact has profound implications for every aspect of our lives. I wouldn't say, you know, we, we've got to distinguish between running out and hitting a, a peak in our ability to supply the market and that's what we're getting close to not not running out um, you know depending on who you believe and um, there's a continuously evolving study that's being done at Caltech on uh, you know what I what I think are fairly compelling ways to look at the remaining recoverable hydrocarbons and in essence we're about 40% through all ultimate recoverable hydrocarbons. So we're not quite halfway. Um, the paradigm that we're involved in is a growth paradigm. You know, the uh, economists basically have to have continuous growth and that's the paradigm that we're operating under, um, which is a totally and completely unsustainable paradigm if we live in a finite world, which we do. And we've um, succeeded in, in bumping up against the, the ecological and energy resource limitations of the planet, um, you know, for geological and ecological reasons. And, you know, my thinking is uh, we have to realize that the growth paradigm is is very close to an end. Um, it's unsustainable. Um, ideally, for sustainability, we need, it at the very minimum, a steady-state paradigm. So there, we operate without growth. Uh, that's uh, Unfortunately, we've overshot the ecological ability of the planet to sustain, to sustain us. And therefore, we're very likely looking at a, a de descent paradigm. So we, we have to look at likely decades of, of managed ascent to get down to some level that's more sustainable. And I uh, you know, think we can do that in two ways. Um, we can keep shoveling bailout money, um, trying to resurrect the growth paradigm that we have been so comfortable with and hit the wall and then let Mother Nature take over. And Mother Nature has a way of fixing resource depletion issues. She's done it many times in the past. And she'll do it again. Um, or we can basically realize where we're at now and where we have to go and start intelligently uh, you know, managing the descent. And if, if I wasn't an optimist, I wouldn't travel all over North America giving talks on trying to make people aware of where we're at at this point in time, you know, mostly in terms of energy in, in my analysis, because energy underpins pretty much all aspects of our, of our society. Um, but there's also the resource limits that we're hitting on, on ecological resources, water resources, soil resources, um, mineral resources, um, so it's all part and parcel of the same thing. But the fact that we've had this incredible abundance of, of cheap um, 
fossil fuels has allowed us to make incredible inroads on all of those other um, vital resources to, to sustain us. And energy is sort of the key to all of that. And energy is the key to all of it. Yeah. Uh, and you've had, you, you, you've done a, a very interesting calculation about what a barrel of oil is really worth. Um, you know, because it's always it's always struck me as being very odd that the, the the cost of a barrel of oil was thought to be, or the value of a barrel of oil was thought to be, the cost of of retrieving it from the ground. But but your analysis of it had to do with the amount of work that that barrel of oil does for us, and and what it would be worth if we had to get it in the traditional human way that we did before petroleum. How, walk me through that. Well, if you look back to the the slave trade. Um, you know, slaves were actually a, the precursors of oil. I mean, oil allowed us to, uh, you know, I think on average each of us has 30 slaves working for us, oil slaves, you know, internal combustion engines. But the calculation referring to, uh, actually I didn't do that, that's uh, a calculation that uh, uh, someone else did, but I, I, I think it's incredibly apt. And it's the amount of energy that a human being can put out on a sustained basis. And uh, you know the Walrus article that, that you've uh, you've seen. If you give somebody <clears throat> statutory holidays off, um, weekends off, and have them work on a treadmill eight hours a day, uh, a barrel of oil is worth 8.6 years of, of labor, and at minimum wage you'd have to pay that person something like $138,000. So a barrel of oil is uh, just an incredible, an incredible energy-dense resource. Um, and it's really fossilized sunshine. Um, you know, I, was, I gave a TV interview earlier today and basically said, you know, oil, gas, and coal, I mean, the only energy that, that we really have on this planet is the energy from the sun. And the conversion process of sunlight to oil, gas, and, and coal is a very inefficient process, which is why it took hundreds of millions of years to, to put the, those retrievable uh, fossil fuels into the ground. Um, we started utilizing oil, uh, first oil well, southwestern Ontario, uh, 1858. So oil's only been with us for about 150 years. Mm -hmm. uh, I told the, uh, the host this morning that 90% of that oil has been burned since 1959, which um, certainly opened her eyes, uh, mm -hmm. half of it since 1984. And that's using data up until 2007. I'm just reworking those slides. I now have the, the new data for, for 2008. I expect it'll probably bump the 90% mark up to 1960. Um, you know, the 10% mark up until 2003. So this is just completely and utterly uh, unsustainable. It's, it's 31 billion barrels every year that, that we're using. Uh, people say, oh yeah, but you know, the price of oil went down to $35 a barrel. Hallelujah, uh, our problems are over. <laughs> <laughs> but the reason it did that was the economic recession. And in fact, that has reduced global demand for oil by somewhere between two and three million barrels per day out of an 86 million barrel per day market. So rather than having the pedal absolutely to the metal, we backed it off to 97%. Um, hasn't really slowed down things too much, but what it has slowed down is exploration expenditures in, in new oil fields. And depletion we know from all of the known pools in the world is about 6.7% per year. And if you look at the ramp up from the newly developed pools, the overall depletion is probably around 5%. So that's something like 4 million barrels per day that, that have to be replaced by new expenditures. And from the time of discovery, to the time of bringing an oil field online is about four to six years. Uh, right now, because of the recession, we're backing off in expenditures in, in new infrastructure to produce oil. 
we're living, the oil that's coming on stream to offset depletion today is from expenditures that were made four to six years ago. Um, the hiatus in investment, uh, and not all companies are, are cutting back, like Exxon is full speed ahead. They're spending $29 billion this year on, uh, on exploration, but a lot of companies have cut back, and in particular the tar sands. Uh, that's going to affect us in, in, you know, two to five years, when that ex investment would be bringing on new supply to offset depletion. So I think uh, if you look at oil production in the world, we've been on a plateau since about 2005, and this hiatus in investment likely means that we're at peak oil at this point in time. Peak in terms of what we could deliver. Peak in terms of what we can deliver. Certainly not running out. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll have oil for a very, very long time, but in a, in a civilization that's run on continuous growth, um, hitting a peak in terms of deliverability is a, is a disaster. I mean, it means that growth can't continue. Uh, we have China, uh, even with the recession, China is chugging along. I think its uh, GDP is expected to be up about 9% this year. Um, a lot of that's fueled by oil. Um, people say, wow, China, India, those people are, are greedy people. They're uh, you know, causing you know, global issues uh, with supply of oil. But I like to say that 1.3 billion Chinese use one-third of the oil that 300 million Americans use. The U.S. Mm -hmm. imports twice as much oil as China consumes in total. So if you want to lay um, blame to rest, uh, it's largely in North America. Our, uh, our consumption levels are roughly five times the world average, um, roughly eight to nine times China's. Uh, the juggernaut of growth in the developing world is uh, you know, there's only a finite amount of, of oil available for export. Mm. And, uh, you know, that's a pretty tight pincher uh, that's, that's coming up on a civilization that's, that's run on oil. Mm. And the geopolitical implications of that are, are pretty scary because I don't think uh, you can really tell the Chinese to stop growing when, in fact, we're using eight times as much <laughs> per capita as they are. Right. Uh, that's just not going to wash. Um, you know, these are nuclear powers, and uh, you know, unless there's sort of a global recognition of you know where we're at in terms of the resource depletion issue, I think uh, you know the prognosis is not particularly good. Mm. Let me back you up to that question of of, of supply because. Um, uh, it seems to me one of the things that you've done quite meticulously is is to go is to look at what the resource actually might be, um, and um, recognizing that it's to some extent a moving target as technology changes and and so forth. But but the but the amount that's actually out there in in oil, natural gas, or coal. Yes, yeah, the concept of net energy. You've hit the nail on the head. That's. Uh you know, we'll never run out of hydrocarbons. And, you know, there's a, there's a pyramid diagram I, I use. And basically I start off by saying that hydrocarbons are infinite. Uh, but the resources at the bottom of that pyramid are the low quality resources, uh, the dispersed resources that uh, take very high investments of energy to recover. In fact, they take higher investments of energy than one would recover uh, by, by trying to get, get them to, the, to a usable state. And so those resources are not, they're not resources, they're sinks, because the net energy is, is lower than what it would take to extract. Um, we've been feeding at the top of the pyramid, at the big pools, um, very high uh, energy return on investment. And as you say, a better technology and higher prices can make uh, more and more of, of those lesser quality resources uh, extractable at a net energy profit. But as soon as we hit the, the break-even point, uh, 
all of the resources below that point, even though they're very abundant, uh, will remain in the ground forever because they're, they're energy sinks, not, not energy resources. Hmm. So let me be, be sure I'm, I'm, I'm clear on this one because I think this is, a, this, is a, this is a really vitally important point that very, very few people understand, uh, which is that it, that it doesn't matter what the price of oil is. If it's going to take you 1.1 barrels of oil to recover one barrel of oil, you know, you're going 10% behind with every barrel you recover and it doesn't matter what the price is, you will, that will never be oil that's worth retrieving. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And we're moving more and more, you know, tell us, tell me a little bit about the, about the, uh, the energy return on investment with respect to the di different sources that we have relied on in the past and what we're, where we're going in the, in the present, like that, that, the trend that we're seeing there. Yeah, if you look at, at Saudi Arabia, for example, a Gawar field was a structural trap. Um, it was easily seen on air photographs. Um, and that's basically an anticline, it's a, a dome. Uh, with incredibly porous um, carbonate rocks within it, uh, highly pressurized. So a vertical well into Guar back in the late 40s, it was discovered in 1948, uh, and it's still the largest uh, pool in the world, uh, about 5 million barrels per day. So roughly 6% of, of world oil comes from that one pool. Uh, the energy payback, uh, was probably greater than 100 to 1. Uh, the energy that it, it took us to drill one of those vertical wells compared to the energy we got back. Today, 100 times, 100 times return on the investment of energy. Right, so yeah. we invest a barrel, we get 100. Um, if we roll things forward, um, you know, there's a lot of exploration in uh, the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, first, the, the shallow parts of the Gulf, uh, those ran out. Now, you know, five or six thousand feet of water, um, drilling uh, very deep wells, um, sometimes horizontal wells, multilateral wells. The uh, Santos Basin off of Brazil, uh, heralded as potentially 33 billion barrels of oil. Uh, that is incredibly difficult to oil. Uh, six or seven thousand feet of water, uh, 20,000 plus. Uh, wells drilling through a, a very thick salt layer um, and you know that's like the ultimate of technology. So that's a 20,000 foot well at the bottom of a 6,000 foot water column. Right. right? So it's like you're like, you're like you know, what, it, six or seven miles down by the time you've done that and you're out in the middle of the ocean when you start. Well yeah five miles. Mm -hmm. And why are we doing that if there's better places to, to find it? There, there's not. I mean, the, the world is, is quite well explored in terms of oil. And, uh, you know, that's what's left. I mean, and even so, um, some of that, that deep water Gulf of Mexico uh, drilling would still probably pay you back 25 barrels for every barrel you spent. You know, the calculation is a little, a little loose. Um, then we can look at things like tar sands. You know, the tar sands, the Alberta government likes to say is, a, a, we should just back up to the Santos Basin in Brazil. That possible 33 billion barrels that's there will likely take decades to extract uh, in a world that's using 31 billion barrels per year. So, I mean, if we could get it all out in a year, it'd be worth, worth about one year of global consumption, mm. uh, which kind of puts it in perspective. The oil sands, uh, or tar sands probably more correctly, uh, 174 billion barrels of oil. I mean, the, the economics really haven't been done on that. Only about 20% of that oil is, is surface mineable. Uh, the energy return on investment of surface mineable oil sands is about six to one. So we, we burn a barrel to get five, uh, but the other 80% is in situ only. Um, so we drill, uh, uh, steam assisted gravity drainage wells. These are uh, horizontal wells uh, where we, we put a horizontal recovery well down at the bottom of the, of the seam of, of bitumen and a, an upper well that basically is heat, steam. So the rocks are, are physically heated up um, to lower the viscosity of the bitumen 
so it will flow to the uh, the lower hole, the collection hole. And the uh, energy return on investment for doing that is about three to one. So we burn a barrel to get two. Um, still not too bad compared to biofuels from corn. If we look at uh, you know the big craze for you know, corn-based ethanol in the U.S. And if you believe people like Pimentel and Patsik, that from Pimentel's from Cornell, uh, he feels that uh, ethanol from corn is energy negative by about a quarter of a barrel. So we burn a barrel, uh, and it costs us a quarter of a barrel. Other people beg to differ with Pimentel. They would say that uh, the energy return on investment is about 1.3 to 1. So we burn a barrel to get three-tenths of a barrel. Uh, when you consider some of the other ecological implications of doing that with corn, uh, you know, water, fertilizer, uh, and so forth, it becomes a big question mark. Uh, you know, biofuels from, from sugar cane, depending on how you do the calculation, are quite a bit better. And there's, uh, you know, they could be as high as five or six to one, the, uh, the ethanol from sugar cane in, in Brazil. Uh, there's ecological implications uh, with doing that. Um, biofuels from palm oil in uh, the Indonesian rainforest, Malaysia, I mean, they're knocking down a lot of rainforest, burning the peat bogs underneath it, and growing uh, palm oil plantations to make biofuels to send to Europe. Um, people have looked at that, the ecological implications of doing that. And just the burning of the of the peat and the and the forests. Um, by the time you net out any kind of carbon reduction from that, it's like decades down the road. It, you know, some calculations have said it's far better just to burn burn oil than uh, biofuels from from those sources. So it's very important to look at the the full cycle costs, mm -hmm. uh, energy cost plus ecological cost of doing this. So the picture, I, the picture that emerges from all of that is that, that there isn't any easy solution to it. Um, the, the, the biofuels uh, would, some might be good at some level, uh, but if you start to do it in, in huge quantities, even in Brazil where you're doing sugar cane or something like that, the, the ecological implications would be pretty scary. Oh, absolutely. And the, yeah. the concept that there's some alternative that can replace 31 billion barrels of oil burned every year to allow business as usual to continue is absolutely a complete and utter non-starter. Not possible. Mm -hmm. uh, let's just get our heads around that. And, uh, you know, everybody says, well, you know, what's the alternative? Uh, and really the alternative is a whole bunch of different things. Um, you know, the concept that there's alternative renewable forms of energy that can come anywhere near close to the 86% of a primary energy that we get from fossil fuels is also a complete non-starter. But nonetheless, there are several contributors on the renewable energy side, wind power, uh, photovoltaics, um, geothermal, um, tidal energy, uh, all of these things are small incremental contributions, but the, the biggest uh, low-hanging fruit is conservation, is knocking down the requirement um, to the absolute maximum level um, and, and efficiency. Uh, you know, I told a lady this morning again that Europeans are about twice as efficient as North Americans in terms of per capita consumption of energy. And there's several reasons for that. Uh, one reason is a lot of Europe was built before cars. Uh, you know, so there are things like mass transit, uh, biking, pedestrian, uh, traveler, much more efficient, much higher densities of people. So mass transit makes a lot more sense when you have a, a higher density population. Uh, and fuel was very expensive, and people understand price, and that has also had a, a big impact. But Europeans uh, live a first world 
standard of living on half the amount of energy of, of North Americans. North America was built after, after cars, in essence. Hmm. Um, you know, the sprawl of suburbia, I mean, it was all designed on, on cheap energy. Uh, so, you know, I, I have a bunch of, of directions that we, we really have to go. Uh, the first thing is um, don't build infrastructure today on the assumption that energy costs will be the same as they are today. Uh, build it on the assumption that energy costs will be much more expensive because of physical supply limitations that we can also already see, you know, uh, in, in our future. Um, don't make it easier for people to drive. You know, don't spend hundreds of millions of dollars on, on new interchanges and, and new highways. Uh, spend that money on alternatives to driving. Uh, much better mass transit, uh, higher densities, and you know, a city like Vancouver is actually, and Toronto, uh, they're actually bringing a lot of people back into the downtown area. Uh, you know, all these condominiums that are going up. And that, that's good because these people can actually access a lot of what they need without a car. Uh, so that's, that's a great step. Um, you know, great beginning, uh, retrofits. A lot of the buildings that we'll have in 1930, or 2030, sorry, will have already been built. So very aggressive retrofits uh, for efficiency are, are absolutely crucial. Uh, so I think there's a lot of different ways that we can basically knock down energy requirements without really seriously impacting people's lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, not that people's lifestyle is not going to be uh, impacted because of what happens after that, right? Um, and we can use the hydrocarbons. We're going to be using hydrocarbons for a very, very long time. Uh, that's just a, a physical reality. Uh, but we have to realize how precious they are. And we have to use them, uh, you know, to their maximum advantage. Uh, yeah, you don't make plastic bags out of them, right? And, uh, you know, that's that that sort of throwaway culture that so much, so many hydrocarbons go into? Right. I mean, that, yeah. that's just a no-brainer. Uh, there's some great pictures on the net of uh, how many plastic bags are thrown out every five minutes in North America. Some phenomenal number. I can't, can't remember it right now. And, you know, plastic bottles and, uh, and cell phones. Like incredible quantities of cell phones are, are thrown out every day in uh, in North America. Um, you know, so the good news is there's there's a lot of low hanging fruit, uh, but there's also a very low level of awareness. Mm -hmm. um, and as I also told a producer this morning, politicians are followers; they're not leaders, uh, and that's just. Uh, somewhat of an artifact of, of our electoral process, uh, the four-year cycle. Uh, people have really bought into uh, climate change in a big way. Uh, I mean, it, most people can tell you something about it. Uh, in terms of the whole concept of energy depletion, uh, the awareness of that uh, is a tiny fraction of climate change. I mean, people can tell you about climate change, not that they're willing to do anything personally about it, but at least they know about it. Uh, I'd say one in 50 may know something about the energy depletion uh, issue if you talk to the, the, the general population. Hmm. And so, you know, politicians are talking about managing carbon because the people that elect, that elect them um, understand that and they think that you know, if we just manage carbon, that business as usual can go on forever. Well, that's not, yeah. that's not true. Let's go back to that point, too, because, because you made that, and I think that's really uh, an important one to, to really stress, is that there is no getting around it. Business as usual is, in a fairly short future, over. Right? And there, is no, there is no possible way to keep on, you know... Um, Doing business at this level of, of uh, fossil fuel intensity, or fuel intensity for that matter, isn't just fossil fuel. Um, 
there's just no way to keep on a, a, a society using energy at the clip that we've been using it. It can't be done. Right. At, at the level that we're using it now, it can't be done. But all of the growth forecasts are assuming we're going to be using even more <laughs> because <laughs> yeah. of the growth paradigm. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so doubly so for that uh, concept. So you made the comment that nature will take care of this if we don't, and and uh, and you also referred to hitting the wall. What would that what would that actually be like in concrete terms? Well, How would nature take care of it. What would what would hitting the wall look like? Hitting the wall uh, would first of all profoundly affect price, um, which in the short term would affect demand, as as we saw with one hundred and forty seven dollar oil last year. Um, so one could expect a bumpy plateau uh, between, uh, you know, price spikes, uh, demand reductions, and I like to tell people depletion never sleeps. That uh, you know, four to five million barrel per day of depletion that has to be made up just to keep supply flat uh, never stops. It's relentless, and as we, you know, the lower quality in terms of net energy sources of liquids uh, take a lot more effort um, to get to a certain level of supply. So the amount of effort to make up for depletion every year is going to get more and more difficult as time goes by. And, uh, you know, people think that the growth paradigm is, is possible um, very likely it's going to unravel into uh, conflicts, you know, probably military conflicts. Uh, China is quite good at uh, running around the world, you know, securing uh, resources, uh, in particular energy resources. They don't have the same constraints as, uh, you know, multinational oil companies, for example. I mean, they can pay what they want and they can pay with arms. Uh, fiber optics infrastructure, things that uh, multinationals uh, where you don't have the option. Um, so that's, that's well and good, you know, as long as we're in a, a time when supply and demand is, is balanced. But the globalization that we've seen, uh, which really makes everybody aware of what everybody else is doing on the planet, I mean, the internet's a, a fantastic thing. Mm. Um, so there's no paucity of, of global knowledge of, you know, what other people have. Um, but likely, you know, globalization is built on cheap energy. You know, just-in-time delivery to Walmart from supply chains that uh, stretch around the world. Um, so I, you know, I, in terms of managing it, there, there's things that, that can be done. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the whole uh, transition towns movement, um, local resist, resilience, uh, local supply chains, uh, you well, know. Jeff Rubin really makes that, uh, at some length, makes the point that you're just alluding to, that, that, that globalization simply ends when cheap energy ends. And, and all yeah. of a sudden you've got to start making things locally and producing things and, and good doing without things that you can't produce locally unless you've got a lot of money to pay for them. And, yeah. You know, it just changes the whole, the whole way you think about, uh, about the world and earning a living and running an economy. Right. Yeah. And, and the, the communities that, that relocalize, and even if it costs more now, they start building the infrastructure that they need to be more resilient. Uh, those are the ones that will kind of make it through with the least, uh, the least impact. Um, you know, people that, that think the growth paradigm and globalization can continue with, you know, higher prices and, and better technology are likely to, uh, you know, suffer in a very bad way mm -hmm. um, going through this. You know, the, the fact of the matter is we have 6.8 billion people on this planet. Uh, largely because of, of hydrocarbons, in my view. Uh, you know, the dilemma as I define it uh, is if you compare the world of 1850 when 82% of our primary energy was renewable biomass and 
only 18% was fossil energy coal. Uh, to today, um, we're 89% of our, or 86% of our primary energy consumption is hydrocarbons. You know, oil, 35%, coal, 27%, natural gas, 24%, uranium, 3%. And only 11% is renewable. Biomass hydrocarbons, or biomass uh, hydroelectric, and you know, wind, PV, all the rest of the renewables. Um, the average person on the planet today consumes eight times as much energy as the average person in 1850. The planet, there's 5.2 times as many people on the planet as there was in 1850. So the, the planet is consuming 45 times as much energy as in 1850. 89% um, non-renewable. Um, and we're on a trajectory of growth. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think, uh, you know, to me, that says it all, you know, likely, uh, likely we're looking at a, you know, in an unmanaged way, probably a population collapse. Um, you know, it, ultimately after this incredible, uh, uh, great ride we've had with hydrocarbons is over, we're going to have to live on solar energy. Um, that's really it. We have to kind of match our needs to the our ability to convert solar energy into you know useful things. Mm. And you know by some analysis, uh, you know North America might be able to support 75 million people. It mm. has close to half a billion right now, so that's uh, about a six to one reduction. Mm. Uh, out the world may be able to support. You know, 1.5 billion. Um, you know, it was supporting about 1.2 in 1850 before it really got started on on oil and, and natural gas. Mm -hmm. uh, whether we can go back to, you know, that level of, of population or not in a in a managed uh, transition way, likely it's it'll be doesn't catastrophic. seem likely, does it? Doesn't no. seem likely. Um, and and uh, um, yeah, it just it, ultimately so much of this comes down to the combination of population and increasing energy intensity. You know, we're, we're all using more, and there's so much more of us. That combination is the lethal one, isn't it? Yeah. And then if you add to that the idea that we think we're going to have economic growth, so that we will use yet more in the future. Yeah. Um, yeah. But one of the one of the moments I found poignant in Chris Turner's article about you was was when you finish the the presentation in Edmonton, and, um, and and Chris is sort of sitting there saying, how can we have heard all this? How can we have presumably grasped all of this? And people are still get, kind of getting up and pouring another cup of coffee and saying, gee, Dave, you've given us a lot to think about here. And uh, you know, the, but the but for Chris, the whole world has changed because of the presentation that you've made, which has just made it absolutely dead clear that what we're doing is, is unsustainable and in the short term will not be sustained, right? And we're not looking at, we're not talking at something that's going to happen two or three hundred years out, we're talking about something 20 or 30 years out, right? Yeah, yeah at the maximum. Yeah. In, in yeah. my view, anyway. Yeah. Climate change has been a diversion from where I think we really need to go. Uh, you know, the Cal Tech study, again, that I mentioned uh, earlier, um, you know, Dave Rutledge keeps updating it. And I, every time I go onto his website, he's got some kind of new fantastic spreadsheet that I have to download and study for a couple of days just to kind of understand everything that he's done. Mm -hmm. And then I can I try to unravel it into sim simple charts that people can understand. But the last one he did, uh, you know, his ultimate recoverable hasn't changed uh, of all hydrocarbons, oil, gas, and coal. But he's used much more sophisticated models in terms of uh, CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere and in terms of what that means in terms of temperature and sea level. And uh, his last calculations would indicate that if we burn all of the remaining recoverable hydrocarbons as fast as we can get them out of the ground, 90% uh, will be gone by 20, 2068. Only about 40% are gone today. Uh, 
and we would get the CO2 levels in the pot in the atmosphere up to about just about 450 ppm, about 448. And he has error bars on his estimates. Uh, I think that you know the positive 90 percent error bar is 448 in about 2060, and the impact on on temperature uh, would be about 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels, above 19th century levels. Um, you know, the politicians at the G8 are running around saying, uh, you know, two degrees is the, the danger threshold. Well, what uh, Rutledge's calculations are, we don't have enough hydrocarbons to get there. And mm -hmm. the implications on uh, sea level, uh, if you look at sea level, uh, it's going up. If you look at the past, 10 decades. Sea level is going up at about 33 millimeters per, per decade. Uh, the impact of that temperature increase uh, will increase that, that mean by about 15 centimeters or 15 millimeters per, per decade. So we'll be up around uh, 50. Um, but you know, there's people running around saying, well, all of the, the ice caps in the Arctic are gonna melt completely. And that's going to raise sea level by 60 meters. Um, and therefore, we should do stuff like, you know, you know the whole, whole thing is predicated, a lot of it, on the fact that if we just manage carbon, business as usual as possible. And that's, you know, I don't, I, I've, I've looked at the whole climate change issue, and I think that the climate is changing. Uh, undeniably, and the climate will continue to change, and therefore, um, you know, adaptation will be part, a big part of of how we manage uh, climate change going forward. Um, all of the initiatives for efficiency and conservation um, that are applied to climate change are very good, right? I mean, those those address both the energy depletion issue and the climate change issue. Great. Um, however, stuff like you know, burying the problem, uh, carbon capture and storage, cr creating a, a very complex infrastructure on top of the complex infrastructure that we already have, um, plus the energy cost of doing that. Uh, you know, retrofitting a coal plant to capture and compress the CO2 is, takes about 30% of the power of that coal plant. So we have to uh, build 30% more coal plants um, just to keep the current uh, electricity production that we have. But yet we want to grow electricity production. Uh, mm -hmm. And we create a whole level of, well, first of all, those plants cost about 50% more. It costs us 30% of the energy in the plants. We have to monitor um, this waste storage for potentially a few centuries. So it's a problem that we leave to future generations, mm -hmm. uh, and the ongoing operating cost of running those uh, plants are are very costly. Uh, nonetheless, um, the G8, and it's a really big deal. Um, you know, building this infrastructure to feel good about the carbon problem while not thinking about the the whole issue of depletion. Mm -hmm. um, Joseph Tainter wrote a. a really a crucial book. I mean, Tainter was a social scientist on the collapse of complex societies. Uh, and among other societies, he looked at the Romans. Uh, and the way Romans, the Romans created wealth um, was by conquering somebody else and taking what they had. <laughs> and uh, that really worked pretty well. I mean, they, they were able to uh, amass a, a great deal of wealth. But, Every time they conquered somebody else, it cost them a certain amount to maintain that, that land. Soldiers, food, had to pay the soldiers. So we had to conquer something else just to get kind of more resources into the system. And eventually their supply lines got, got so stretched. I mean, their currency, which was once pure silver, ended up having almost no silver just because they had to dilute it. So much it's like printing money, mm -hmm. you know, at the mint in uh, in Washington. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And 
Tantra's thing is, uh, you know, complexity is a solution to sustainability as long as you have the energy and financial resources to pay for it. But as we're seeing with energy resources, um, the net energy is going down, 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 down. It's approaching one. Um, and that's, you know, as soon as you don't have the... And at that point, you're down to, you're down to solar, living on your solar income. Right. Then, much, eh? then involuntary simplicity is imposed. And it's either intelligent, intelligently managed, which is a, a resilient solution, or it's collapsed. Uh, the Romans collapsed. Uh, you know, certain societies existed because there was always, always something else to take over. Um, but there's no more planets at this point in time. We've globalized this one. We've pretty much maxed it out. We've become very good at, at identifying and extracting uh, the resources that this planet has. Uh, so, you know, that's where we're headed. If you, if you look at people like Bill Rees, who's uh, invented the concept of the ecological footprint, yeah. uh, we're at about 1.3 planets at this point in time. There's a group that calculates, uh, it's like Tax Freedom Day. Mm -hmm. yes. But this yeah. is when we've consumed all of the ecological resources that have been delivered this by the year. Earth. And that break-even day is in September. So the rest of the year, we're, we're running on stored ecological and, and energy resources that the planet has created. You can't keep doing that uh, forever. And, and, you know, if you look at uh, the Chinese, uh, the Indians, the Chinese are about one, one eighth of North America's per capita consumption of energy. Yeah. Um, the U.S. government is forecasting uh, a doubling of that per capita consumption, so by 2030. So if, the, if China could actually double by 2030, each Chinese person would be consuming a quarter of the energy of the average North American. You know, if business as usual could actually exist. Business as usual and growth as usual. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, how many yeah. Earths would we need at that point? Um, likely two. To get the developing world to the level of Europeans, which are twice as efficient as North Americans, would probably take three or four planets. So that, that's the, uh, the severity of, of the, the situation that we're in at this point in time. And it's, and it's really underappreciated, I mean, I, I, to, to put it very mildly, that, that, that there is this kind of difficulty. Um, <clears throat> and I guess the thing I, I, I keep I keep thinking is so important about what you've been doing and saying is just underlining the fact that there is there there are no magic bullets. There's nothing that technology is going to do that's going to lead us out of this. It's it's uh, um, you know we we um, we have, we're on a path that is completely unsustainable in a very short time and in an area that we're not paying much attention to. In other words, energy energy depletion. And you know the IPCC is sort of the uh you know, the climate change um, scientific um, mm -hmm. knowledge dispenser. And uh, the IPCC has 40 different scenarios of, uh, you know, carbon emissions into the atmosphere. And Rutledge has looked at them all and calculated, uh, you know, how much oil, gas, and coal you'd actually have to have to get there. And then compared it to his very careful analysis of what's, what's left that's recoverable. The IPCC only goes out to 2100. And by, so that's not the totality of the resources that they say are recoverable, it's just how much is going to be burned by 2100. 7.4 times as much recoverable hydrocarbons as Caltech's calculation. And, and Caltech... It isn't there. Right? Which isn't there. Yeah, yeah. Um, so. And, you know, I, I, I consider myself very fortunate at this point in my life in that I really don't have um, any vested interests in my analysis. I try to keep it as objective as I can and try to look at as many different sources as I can. Um, 
a lot of people do have vested interests in, in acad academia. I mean, their research funding is riding on, is riding on what they say mm -hmm. and uh, what they believe. Um, whereas I think that it's, it's way too late for that. We need the absolute most objective, unemotional analysis of what's facing us. You know, there's no time for vested interests, there's no time for emotion. Um, this has to be just a rigorous, very pragmatic um, analysis of, of the many different things that can be done, mm -hmm. and then get on with it. Because we really don't have a lot of time to spare at this point. Right. The Caltech analysis, now presumably they take into, or Rutledge takes into account the possibility of, of the sort of tipping point phenomenon, that you get to the point where global warming doesn't necessarily melt the Antarctic ice, but it splits the Antarctic ice off and big chunks of it go into the sea and that's, you know, that sort of thing. I mean, I, I guess one of the things that I've always wondered is what are the, what are the unexpected things out there that, that, that yeah. we're not, you know, uh, what are the tipping points where all of a sudden you've got the tender emitting methane that, that uh, were... I, you know? uh, I, I suspect that he hasn't. You know, I, I expect that that's... It's mostly a statistical analysis of, of the past. Yeah. You know, he's looked at all of the, the CO2 measurements, like the Vostok ice core, the Mauna Loa CO2 uh, data, which are some of the best in the world, and how much physical carbon there is left in the remaining recoverable hydrocarbons. But yeah, sure, you can, I mean, you know, it could be worse than that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, melting the permafrost uh, could release a lot of methane. Uh, methane is 20 times as potent as CO2, as a greenhouse mm -hmm. gas. Um, but just phys physically based on, on the carbon emitted from hydrocarbons, which is what the IPCC has basically based it on. Uh, you know, that's what you get. Yeah, you can't get there, but it could be. But so presumably, we could have a much worse situation than uh, than, than even that pretty comprehensive. Yeah, but but when you uh, you think of how valuable hydrocarbons are to everything, right? Um, I have a solutions. You know, I thought about a lot of this stuff. Probably not as in much detail as others, other certain people have anyway, but we need a lot of hydrocarbons to build what comes next. You know, I've looked at uh, a windmill, like a two megawatt windmill, um, 260 tons of steel, 300 tons of iron ore, 170 tons of coking coal to smelt that iron ore into the, into the steel you need for a windmill. Um, that's not calculating the cement, uh, the fact that all those materials were mined and transported by hydrocarbons. So without hydrocarbons, it's very difficult to build a, a high-tech, renewable energy future. I mean, we just need the hydrocarbons in order to do that. And now we're, we're burning them going to Walmart, um, buying stuff that comes from China <laughs> that we don't need. And this itself made out of hydrocarbons too large. Which is made out of hydrocarbons. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, you know, these are, are not evil by themselves. They're evil maybe the way we're using them. Mm -hmm. um, and if you want to keep 6.8 billion people alive on this planet, um, we have to use that precious resource to our maximum advantage. I've forgotten who it was, whether it was Kenneth DeFace, that, um, that made the comment that this was an enormous one-time gift and uh, that, that enabled us to reach a level of, uh, of development, or uh, if it is developed, but enable us to reach a level that we could never have reached without it. And that was, um, uh, if we don't use it properly, we slip back to exactly where we were in, in the first place, and only yeah. with, the, with the detritus of a whole failed civilization around us. Yeah. And I think that's not quoting him, but that was but his point was, the gift is there, it's the same point you're making, you need a lot of hydrocarbons to do whatever you're going to do to get beyond the need for hydrocarbons at the level we've been using them. Exactly, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. This is a one-time gift that 
that represents, you know, what what could be preserved to 500 million years of sunlight. Yeah. And yeah. It, we're not creating oil <laughs> and coal and natural gas at anywhere near the rate that we're burning them. Yeah. So we need to to understand that and uh, plan our future. Yeah. Have we not covered anything that, that uh, oh yeah, yeah, there is an area, of, um, one of them is, there, there's maybe a couple of them, one of them is, um, we haven't really talked about food, but that's a point that you raise late in your piece on carbon shift, um, you know, that, that uh, um, if you run out of hydrocarbons, you have a food crisis almost immediately, and you can't support the 6.8 billion, can you? No. Absolutely not. You know, the Green Revolution uh, was basically nitrogen from fossil fuel-based fertilizers, mostly natural gas. You know, the, uh, the, the average yield of corn back in 1930 was about 30% of what it is today with heavy inputs of uh, fossil fuel-based nitrogen. So, you know, I think I mentioned in Carbon Shift that the, uh, the grain supply in the world um, is at quite low levels. And I think in the, in the U.S. it's something close to what it was in 1946. Um, so very tight supply-demand balance right now with very heavy applications of, uh, of fertilizers. Um, you know, there's talk of fossil or phosphorus limitations kind of going forward um, which are you know incredibly important mm -hmm. so yeah food is food is a huge issue so have we taken this conversation to the point where we really we really have to conclude that they that the present population of the earth is itself unsustainable and and like there's no way you can actually feed that number of people if you don't have the fuel you don't have the fuel therefore you can't have the people is that too brutal an analysis? No. I, I think it's going to be very difficult. Um, and I think we have to realize that and, and ramp down the population. You know, it doesn't have to be catastrophic. Or it will be if we don't do it uh, in a voluntary manner. Yeah. You know, the UN and the U.S. Bureau of Census are talking about 9.3 billion people in 2050. Well, even if we decrease the average per capita consumption of, of the whole world by 30%. If we grow the planet by 50% by 2050, we've more than consumed all of those uh, energy savings. Yeah, so if you don't deal with, with population, there's really nothing that you can do. Yeah, and when I fair? give my talk, people come to that conclusion <laughs> at the very end. Population is the number one problem, yeah. uh, followed by a lot of other problems. But yeah, uh, yeah. Well, in a sense, going back to your 1850-2007 analysis, that you 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 have the the huge increase in population accompanied by the huge increase in the use of fossil fuels and yeah. other forms of energy. So you have a uh, so you have a sort of a compounded problem by the time you get to 2007. But it has those two components, and, yes. and you can't. You can't deal with the total problem unless you deal with both the components. Right? Uh, I've been to climate change conferences, listened politely to all the stuff, and somebody says, what about population? I've had the head climate modeler at U of T say, oh, I can't talk about that. That's not politically correct. It's what? Um, you know, this was a conference they had in Banff. They had a climate change day with some of the you know, the best climate modelers on the planet. Then they had an energy day. And I started it off with a one hour lecture. And the first thing I got into was population. I mean, if you don't, if you don't talk about this, I, I usually start my talk with population and I finish it. And then if people don't understand that, I've got a couple of comments in my, my final wind up summary, <laughs> just to make sure that they they get that point. Yeah. But it, nonetheless, it's politically incorrect, uh, you know, amongst many academics that are relying on, you know, other groups for their funding. 
going forward. Uh, but this argues a kind of a species stupidity, doesn't it? I mean, that, that, that uh, um, one of the things I think I know about Dave Hughes already is that is that you don't back away from where the logic and the and the and the data lead you, right? And uh, but what you're really describing is a scientific establishment which does. Yeah. A lot of it, yeah. And, and does because of political assumptions. Well, the guys that that really don't are are people like me <laughs> that don't have vested interests. Uh, Walter Yonquist, uh, who wrote a book called Geodestinies, which is one of the, he's a consulting geologist in Oregon, he's 86. Walter sends me stuff every couple of weeks. He doesn't have a computer, so he mails it to me. And uh, what an incredible guy, sharp as a tack. I lifted up my cell phone the other day and I got a message from Walter. He said, Dave, I heard you moved to Cortez Island, how are things? And I've got a lot of stuff I want to talk to you about on the, the tar sands and things like that. Walter sent me this uh, picture a year, a year or so ago. And uh, it's from the Mineral Information Institute in Boulder, Colorado. And it's a picture of a baby. And every American born today will consume in his lifetime. It's 500,000 pounds of coal. You know, 1,400 pounds of, of copper, four ounces of, of gold, um, you know, 86,000 gallons of gasoline, you know, 500,000 cubic feet of natural gas, you know, so much cement and building stone. And they've taken all of the resources that the U.S. uses and is divided up by the population. And every year a new baby comes out. I just got the 2009 baby last week. 3.2 million pounds of minerals, metals, and fuels. That's how much will be consumed in a lifetime. And all of that stuff is mined and extracted by hydrocarbons. So that sort of, you know, that's another issue that's far beyond just energy. If I go back to the question of what happens if we don't act, and I can't think it's very likely that we're going to act sufficiently dramatically and on a sufficiently large scale to make a great difference to the picture you've, you've outlined. I just don't see the, you know, and, and, and I don't even see it in me. I mean, I, you know, I see all, all the, you know, I, I become familiar with this kind of thing and on several fronts and, and I try to change my behavior, but I know the, beha the behavior changes that I make are trivial compared to I, the scale of the problem. Yeah, I feel bad. I, I burn a huge amount of jet fuel running around uh, trying to make people aware of some of these issues. Um, I like to think that that you know, maybe is a worthwhile expenditure. You know, personally, um, and I'm in an enviable position because I've, I have a pension. It comes in, rain or shine. Uh, you know, I live on Cortez Island. I have a half acre garden. We're able to supply a very large amount of our, our food needs um, from that garden. I burn firewood to heat my house. Um, the net energy on that firewood is, is like the Gowar field in, in 1948. You know, better than 100 to 1. It's all mostly blow down. Some Mother Nature blows it down for me. I cut it up, put it in a wheelbarrow, and roll it 200 meters to my house and it heats my house. Um, chainsaw? I, how's that? Chainsaw? I have a chainsaw. Yeah, so that's almost your only energy input for that, right? Yeah, I will. I, Hydrocarbon. I have a small pickup. Yeah. And I, you know, that pickup gets started usually to do like truck stuff. I mean, if I have a pile of firewood that's 600 meters from the house, then it goes into the truck and the truck brings it to the house. Uh, but in terms of like going shopping or buying stuff uh, or going down the hill, because I have a two kilometer driveway, that truck may get started every five or six days, you know, for a short run. Um, but I, then I, you know, like I say, I have a pension, I don't have to go to work. Um, I have a satellite dish 
It's connected to a geostationary satellite 38,000 kilometers away. Um, I'm a consulting geologist as well. Uh, the internet is, is fabulous. I mean, all of the stuff that I need to do my research uh, travels, you know, 76,000 miles out to that satellite and comes back through my little 75 centimeter dish into my computer. So if I go to work, I walk from the second floor down to my nice cozy little chair in front of my fireplace and uh, fire up the laptop. And I think, you know, I think the net is one of the, uh, one of the technologies that really is enabling. I mean, it, you know, you can do so much, you know, through the net and never, never move, never commute. And, you know, just that in itself, you know, has a huge uh, potential, you know, to allow people to work and do stuff intellectually without ever, uh, you know, having to commute long distances to go to work. It's true. It's true. Yeah. Like the net, the net is one of my main things sort of in my solutions area. Um, you know, as, you know, quadruple the price of fuel immediately. I'm not like Campbell. It's not a, a carbon neutral or it's not a, a money neutral tax. That tax goes back into infrastructure to give people an alternative for driving. You know, if you drive into a, a, a downtown area that's served by mass transit, there's a huge tax, um, which makes it, people can still do it, but it makes it very expensive. And all of that tax gets plowed into to new infrastructure, to retrofits and, and you know, much more efficient uh, infrastructure. Mm -hmm. For Dave Hughes, the absolute highest priority is to cut back on our use of fossil fuels dramatically and in an orderly way, starting yesterday. Or deal with the fact that nature and the market will combine to impose those cutbacks on us. When oil goes to $200 or $400 a barrel, our economy will be changed beyond recognition. If you want to know more about what that kind of world will be like, stay tuned for our interview with economist Jeff Rubin. And if you want to know more about the social, environmental, and even political costs of trying to extract oil from such unconventional sources as the Alberta tire sands, you'll want to catch our audio interview with Andrew Nikiforik. Thanks for joining us. For The Green Interview, I'm Silver Donald Camp. See you next time. Thank you.